routine. You guys know me. I'm in the office. I actually just redid the office. So I don't know if you guys have stopped by, but I have a nice accent wall now. There's a red oh. wall there. I like it. I don't know. It's cool. So um, I do. Yeah, so yeah. I, we, will, gonna... we will visit you because I told yeah. Nazar. Come told visit. Him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I'm coming in like twice a week now um, and we have a new uh, team member also that's joined us. Um, and so some of the new commitments, you know, that I have made to my partners um, is, you know, every, every client that I do um, connect with is getting a full 30 minute consultation. This has been really successful for um, new buyers because I found that in the past, you know, trying to just answer the call and, you know, answer questions very quickly is not efficient. So instead, I schedule out 30 minute consultations with everyone to help them understand the complete buying process, the different loan options that are available. And it's just been a, a really uh, big difference in educating the clients up front on how everything works. So even if they talk to another lender, after they've talked to me, they get they usually get a lot more information than just having a quick conversation with whoever answered the phone first. So that's something new that I have implemented. So just keep that in mind. Um, everyone is getting a 30 minute consultation to talk about their home loan options and understanding what the buying process looks like. Um, and then also, I just wanted to mention that we do have 24 hour pre-approvals. And that's something that I've been doing regularly. So just wanna remind you that that 24 hour pre-approval is available if you ever need an expedited pre-approval, that's also an option. So just let me know if you ever have someone that needs to get a rush before that 24 hour period. Um, and then of course we have our 10 day closing program that has been very popular um, with this competitive market and that's 10 business days. So we are able to close in two weeks, FHA or conventional. And the last add-on that we've had recently is uh, an on-demand pre-approval letter. I have a, a mobile app now that allows you to download a pre-approval letter for any um, buyers that we have together that need uh, to submit an offer at whatever hour of the day, day of the week, you can instantly download that pre-approval letter to support your offer. So those are some of the, the changes that we've had recently that I wanted to share with you. Um, today, the focus is on avoiding a dis disastrous results and cancellation letter. Um, so today we're going to have Megan Stokes here. She's our special guest. She's going to talk to us more about things that you can avoid in the um, real estate transaction that will stop that cancellation letter. And, and I'm sure you guys are going to have questions. We all have gone through unique situations. So do feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, this is an open forum. So we just, we want to share information and, and of course have conversations with you. So um, Megan, tell us a little bit more about you. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time today. I know you guys are probably just as busy as Michelle and I are, so we really appreciate you being here to listen to us today. My name is Megan Stokes, and I own the firm Law Office of Megan Stokes, LLC. I have been practicing in the real estate field for a little over five years now. Uh, so welcome to Make It to the Closing Table, Avoiding Disastrous Results in the Dreaded Cancellation Letter. Uh, the focus today, I will be going over some of the contingencies in place in the contracts that we all use that protect both buyer and seller and give them the ability to cancel the contract without penalty. And I'll give you guys some tips that I have um, come, to found, to come to find in my years of practice, uh, tips that will help us all from getting that dreaded cancellation letter in our email saying that the, uh, the other side has canceled. Um, so since you all, I don't know if this is, there we go. Um, so since you all are just meeting me for the first time, I want to take the opportunity to introduce myself and explain the philosophy that I take with all my contracts, clients, and realtor partners. Uh, we all want to look good in front of our clients. So I make sure that that's front of mind at all times, um, for my realtor partners, especially you are a reflection of who you refer to your clients. Um, so I do everything in my power to make you guys look amazing. And not every attorney out there is going to be able to, to make you look the best to your clients. So uh, just really quick, some things that, that I do that differentiate me from other attorneys. Uh, I'm very responsive. I respond to emails within 48 hours. Oftentimes it's within the business day. I answer my phone. I return phone calls. Uh, that all seems very basic, but from what I've heard from other realtors out there, their attorneys aren't necessarily doing that. 
Um, I understand a lot of your work as agents occurs on the weekends. So I am available on weekends. If you guys need to talk anything over, if your clients have any um, emergencies or if they're feeling a little uneasy in the process, I'm available to, to talk things through with them. I had a call on this past Saturday with a client actually who was a little unsure about some condo documents. Uh, so I spent about 30 minutes on the phone with them to talk things through to make sure they felt comfortable moving forward. I really take a team-based approach with all of my transactions. I like to strategize with the agents and the lenders to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, we're all up to date on everything that's happening in the transaction, especially because I recognize that there are some things that you as the realtors have a better pulse on in the transaction, such as the other side's temperament. I'm very um, aware of uh, finicky buyers or sellers on the other side. And I would not want to be the one to accidentally mess up a transaction because of a request that I think is normal, but you know that the other side will absolutely flip out about. Um, details matter to me. I'm very detail oriented. Uh, as a quick example, I saved a client over $5,000 in property tax preparation credits. Uh, the other attorney left a pin number off the settlement statement. Um, I caught that in clients got about $5,000 extra in credits at closing. And finally, I'm very big on education I make sure my clients understand the whole real estate transaction from contract to closing, um, how they're protected under the contract. And I also like to educate my realtor partners, which is why we are here today. So as we all know, there are a number of contingencies built into the real estate contract whether you're using the car condo form or the 7.0. These are what I like to call hurdles to make it to the closing table. So we have um, the three that I wanna talk about today are the attorney review period, the inspection period, and the condo document contingency period, obviously assuming that we have a condo unit. And what I've found during my years as a real estate attorney is that communication is key we can't hide things from the other side. Um, we can spin things a certain way, uh, but we, we can't hide things for both legal and practical reasons. Uh, we also need to make sure we are as prepared as possible. The goal with these contingencies is to make our way through them as quickly and thoroughly as possible, especially the attorney review and home contingency periods. As I'm sure everyone here knows, those two contingencies are the easiest times to break the contract and the biggest hurdles to get over. So we want to move through these contingencies as quickly as possible, especially in case the other side gets cold feet. Um, but I do want to caution that I don't move through these contingencies so quickly um, that clients are uncomfortable. I like to make sure that a client is comfortable if they're uncertain about moving forward, um, you know, we'll slow down, make sure they get all the information they need to um, feel comfortable moving forward. The last thing any of us want is a client who just does not feel good about uh, purchasing a property. That is not the goal. That's not why we got into this, this type of work. So the, the main goal is to have little to no issues brought up during these contingencies. Um, the first two that pop up in the contract are going to be attorney review and inspection. Um, they run concurrently, but they're two separate contingency periods. The first um, contract review, I'm sorry, attorney review, the contract tells us that we can cancel for any reason that isn't solely based on purchase price. So what that really means is you can cancel for any reason, um, as long as it's not solely purchase price. Um, there's never been any issue canceling in my, um, my experience, it's very easy to just say there are other reasons other than purchase price. I have a question about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I had a buyer that there, uh, whose, whose contract was canceled by the seller mm -hmm. and we didn't really know why. And so, and it was during the attorney review period. So, mm -hmm. I mean, when the attorney review letters go out, is there a reason that's stated or can you, can you literally say that you know, you're canceling on reasons other than that, you know, the purchase price and not disclose the reasons for the cancellation. Yeah, so you, you don't have to disclose the reasons for the cancellation. The contract doesn't require it. Um, obviously, we're always kind of curious what happens right. in, in that instance. I mean, it could be anything. It could be um, 
you know, they change their mind on the closing date. Um, oftentimes what I suspect happens, but the other side will never admit this, is that they have um, interest at potentially a higher contract purchase price or even a quicker closing or maybe it's a cash deal. Um, all of those things can come into play there. Uh, and all they have to do is say they're canceling for reasons other than the purchase price. They don't have to tell us why. Wow. Um, yeah. See, so that that's news to me because I've never mm -hmm. had a buyer, a buyer's deal canceled by the seller side in yeah. the first week with no reason. So yeah. that was the first. Yeah, it does happen. And so that's why, you know, we want to move through these contingencies as quickly as possible and not really give the other side the um, the time to send wow. that cancellation letter. Obviously, sometimes we, we can't avoid it, um, but we can do everything in our power to to make sure that it that it goes through. Cool. I have a question here, same. Yeah. It was from the, uh, not from the seller side, but from the buyer side. Okay. So after we just uh, put them offer and then uh, they said, oh, this is very small now. We are, we are not going into it. So we had to cancel. Mm -hmm. So that is also, you know, like, once they decided to buy it and suddenly like, you know, in like four or five hours, I'm getting, you know, like a reply, you know, from the, I'm getting a, email, a text message from my buyer that, you know, they don't want to go forward. Mm -hmm. So that also happened like that. So uh, I don't yeah. know the mind, they could not decide before, like no reason, like only just the thing, it was small kitchen and they had something in the kitchen that they didn't, they didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And they, yeah, they did let me, so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's really easy to cancel during this time. Um, and that would be something that that is allowable, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I have here um, that realtor involvement during this period is key. And I have that there because, um, you know, you guys heard me mention earlier that you guys have a better pulse on the other side's temperament than I do. Um, you presumably went back and forth with the, the other, other agent negotiating the offer. Um, so I always like to check in with, with my realtor partners to make sure that none of the client's requests, none of my standard requests that I put in there, nothing's going to um, upset the other side so much that they would cancel the contract. Um, are there any other questions on attorney review period? I have another question. Yeah, shoot. So, so then when you're sending out the letter after the inspection period um, or after the inspection, are you sending a copy of the report or are you just kind of like giving them a punch list of like the bigger items that they're concerned about? Like what's your normal process with that? Yeah, great question. Um, so I send the attorney review and the inspection requests in the same letter, even though they're separate contingency, I contingency excuse me, contingencies, I found that it's just um, more efficient to do it that way. So if they have um, a specific list, I will write, just take the language straight from the inspection report, write it in the letter, um, request that they have a licensed qualified contractor repair, that they provide paid receipts before closing. Um, and then if it is a car contract, I send the inspection report over. If it's a 7.0, I don't because the contract expressly prohibits you from sending the inspection report over unless the seller requests it in writing. Um, so mo oftentimes um, the seller will request it, but sometimes they don't. They don't want to, I guess, know all the details in the inspection report because then they're put on notice of um, you know, potential issues, things like that. So inspection contingencies, um, as a seller, well, let me back up a little bit. Under the inspection contingency, um, the buyer can cancel if something in the report is just too big of a hurdle for them to want to deal with. Um, some reasons that I've come across, structural issues, foundation issues, um, sometimes there's just too many little things and it just adds up and they don't wanna deal with it. Um, if the buyer makes requests that are not related to major components, so systems like the AC, um, electrical, plumbing, appliances, things of that nature, the seller um, under the 7.0 can just immediately cancel the contract. Um, and then you can also cancel if no agreement can be reached after going back and forth between the parties. 
uh, because of these reasons, I think with sellers, it is so important for us to be prepared to know what the buyer could possibly raise during this contingency period. And I really do recommend that um, the seller get a pre-listing inspection. Yes, they have to go a little out of pocket for it, um, but it allows them the chance to fix issues um, so that the buyer doesn't even know that it's something that was a problem. Because when, when you have these inspection reports that have 20, 30 items of you know, little things, GFCI outlets, um, there's leaks, um, no hand railings is something that I see a lot, things like that, they can add up and really scare buyers away. So in order to prevent that dreaded cancellation letter during this time, um, I really do think it's important that sellers know what could be raised and they can either um, make an informed decision on whether to repair certain things. And as a realtor, you guys can help them determine um, what some sticking points would be for potential buyers. And um, I'm just asking. Yeah, I saw that. If Sorry, anyone... I got distracted. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll monitor the chat. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Um, so yeah, so I really, really recommend this. If the seller does not want to go out of pocket, then for um, a pre-listing inspection, then at the very least, I really recommend you guys walk through the home with the seller if you don't already and just come up with your own punch list of items that, that you think based on your experience a buyer would um, be sensitive about or want fixed. This allows us to move through inspection really, really quickly. We don't have to go back and forth on quotes um, or back and forth on credit offers because usually sellers will offer credit versus um, repairs. It really just gets us through inspection as quickly as possible. Um, and in the event that your seller does not want to fix things ahead of time, then, um, and you know, if we're in the situation where we have to get some quotes either from the seller side or the buyer side, it's really just important to keep the other side um, in the loop. You know, we're collecting quotes, we'll be in touch soon. Um, I had a seller that just closed last week who did not take the realtor's advice to um, handle some of these issues before they listed. Um, I think we ended up going back and forth one, two weeks because of how many items they requested um, get repaired. And so I just checked in with the, the, uh, the buyer's attorney every couple of days to let them know where we're at. Um, I sent periodic response letters so that we could close out little items that they requested um, to really narrow down the list and make sure that they knew that we were moving forward, that, um, you know, take take any uncertainty or stress away from the buyer so that they would continue on in the transaction. And it worked really well. We got everything done, closed, everything was, was great. Um, one quick item here on um, if buyer makes requests not related to major components, um, oftentimes buyers like to request cosmetic items. Um, let's say there's a crack in a bathroom sink or the caulking in a tub is not up to par. Um, we really have to make sure we, we counsel our client, our buyer clients that those aren't really contemplated by the contract as, as defects and let them know that if they make those requests, obviously if they push forward and they wanna make those requests, then we have to um, abide by their wishes. But we just, it's, you know, it's our responsibility, mine specifically as the attorney to let them know um, the consequences of that and, and what could happen. So are there any questions on inspection periods? Okay, I'll move forward. And the condo documents. Um, so at some point in the transaction, if it's a condo, um, condo documents are going to get exchanged. If we represent the sellers, we want to get those condo, condo documents over to the buyer as soon as possible. Um, again, we want to make sure we don't give this, the buyers any time to develop cold feet in the transaction. They can cancel the contract um, during this condo document period, uh, which is five business days from receipt of the condo documents. 
they can cancel if anything um, is revealed that would affect their use of the property or would result in an increased financial burden. Uh, so it's really important to do some research ahead of time on the condo documents. Um, for instance, are there pets allowed? Um, if your client has a dog and the condo does not accept dogs, there's really no point in even putting in an offer because uh, they're not going to, um, you know, they're going to cancel during the condo document contingency. Uh, you're going to want to know if they are allowed to rent out the unit, what the rules with that are, um, if there's any rental caps. It's really, really good to get this information ahead of time because um, you know, we're all very, very busy. We don't want to essentially waste our time going through the transaction if it's if it's not going to work out for for our buyer clients. Um, let's see. We also want to know a big pain point for clients are um, potential uh, special assessments in the future, even if something hasn't been uh, specifically decided on by the board, by the association. We want to know if there's anything out there that could possibly um, be assessed in the future. We want to know. Um, we want to know if there's any upcoming capital expenditures, how they plan on funding those capital expenditures. These are all things that I keep an eye out for when I review condo documents for my buyers. Um, so if we represent sellers, we wanna make sure we don't hide that information from the buyers, that we, we give that to them as soon as possible. Again, lowering the chance of cold feet from the buyers. Uh, one note with this condo document contingency, a lot of people think that it, um, is covered by the attorney review period and it's not it's a separate contingency so we can close out attorney review and move forward through the transaction um, and hit this condo document contingency um, later we don't have to keep attorney review open while condo documents are being reviewed and if you work with any attorneys that do um, they need to not be doing that because that just gives the buyer way too much freedom to cancel the how many do they reason. have for a condo contingency so um, from the date that we receive the documents from the seller uh, buyer clients have five business days to review okay. the documents and uh, notify the seller if they want to cancel the contract after that review okay yeah. Which documents is it the 22? Yep. Point yeah, great question. Um, or is it the full? So it's the 22.1. We're going to get meeting minutes, um, budgets. Uh, the paid assessment letter usually doesn't come till closer to closing. Um, but at that point, that's really just a formality. We already know um, what the monthly assessments are. We already know if there's any special assessments. Um, what else are we getting? We're getting rules and regulations, um, governing documents like the bylaws and the condo declaration. We are getting um, any transfer packets that the association needs in order to facilitate uh, the transfer process and to get that 22.1 in the paid assessment letter um, issued. So I have a question about this because we yeah. always collect condo documents for approval, right? So mm -hmm. the buyer, when it's a management company, the buyer has to pay for this. So if these items have to be provided by the seller, then the seller will be paying for this. And then we don't have to order this for the buyer. Is that right? Well, you guys have a separate like condo questionnaire, right? Right. That's the yeah. only thing that would be, that would be outside of that packet, but all other documents then technically can't, should be provided by the seller. Yeah, they should already be provided by the seller. Okay. Yeah. What um what documents do you typically does the buyer end up having to pay for? So it just depends. If it's a full review, you know, we need everything. Um, but if it's a limited review, it's just the questionnaire. Mm -hmm. So it, it just depends. But what I find is that, and I've had some, I've had the sellers provide information at times, but it also takes several weeks. So that's another thing is that we're in a time crunch. We mm -hmm. have to get the condo approved in the first two weeks. And I'm not seeing anything from the seller side. If I ever do get it, it's usually after that two week period. Mm, okay. That's good to know on my end. Yeah. So how soon are you seeing these documents being provided to buyers typically? Um, typically it's usually with, if the seller's attorney is on top of things, 
um, a week to two weeks after, um, after contract acceptance. Some attorneys won't order them until attorney review is over because they don't want their clients to have to pay. Right. Um, so, because if, if a contract is canceled, then the seller then has to pay for the next buyer because a new 22.1 has to be issued. Um, and we can't just use the one from the old buyer. So I think that's probably where you're seeing some of that delay there. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, this is for both um, you, Megan, and for Michelle. Um, when it comes to requesting the condo docs, whether it's for the finance or for the 22.1, and at any time, do you require the agent to be involved in that request and send those docs, or is it done by you, the attorney, and you, the lender? Great question. Um, so I'll answer from my perspective. I have had instances where um, the listing agent will have some documents uh, like the, the bylaws, the condo deck, maybe even some rules and regulations. And they send that um, like initially and off the bat. And I, I like that because it gives the buyer um, those documents early. So we can try to close out the contingency as soon as possible. Um, some issues with that, though, are if the listing, if the seller's attorney is not on top of um, quickly requesting the remainder of the condo documents, like the 22.1, um, then we can have some sort of delays and things can kind of be disjointed a little bit. Uh, so I work with, with the agents that I work with when I represent sellers, I make sure that um, if they're going to be turning over documents early, a, I like that. <laughs> and B, I'm going to go ahead and um, order documents from my end as soon as possible so that everything can just get delivered to the buyer um, in one shot instead of having like a couple condom documents come across this week. And then next week, it's a couple more. It kind of gets hard to keep track of at that point. And it really gives the buyer a longer time period to right. uh, digest information and again, possibly get cold feet. I probably should have called this like, don't let your the other side get cold feet. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, and then the five days, that wouldn't take place until you have all the documents as a whole, correct? So it, yep. it's kind of like just spreading out all, all of them. So yeah, um, we have had attorneys that are telling our agents that it's their responsibility to file a 22.1. And that's where I was getting confused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I do as the attorney, I, I always request it because um, it's so, A, there's legal obligations to do it. So it really, in my opinion, does fall under the attorney's role. Um, yes. but I don't know if you were on earlier, um, when I was going through my philosophies, I really take a team-based approach. Um, so if, you know, if you as the realtor want to give some, um, you know, that's, that's great, get us started. And then I would just follow up by requesting something, um, you know, ASAP. I just love your approach because it's oh, so important you. to have that team yeah. and, you know, to, to, to have clarity at the beginning and to, you know, for agents to reach out, to introduce themselves, you have a, a, a client that you're working together in the best interest on both sides, you know, regardless, you know, of, of what you're doing and to everyone come together and have a clear understanding of how we can help each other and, and get this deal closed. Yeah, and and exactly. that's why I appreciate your clarity in that because um, there are so many attorneys out there that don't have that approach mm -hmm. and, and they they come across as being burdened by uh, agents calling them. Did you did you request the 22.1? Did you do this? And hey, hey, I got this. Don't worry. Just And, and then we're still waiting and there's yeah. no communication and no answers. And, you know, granted, we have to work in the best interest of our client and, and get them to that accepted offer. But we also have to be the CEO of our transactions and oversee everyone else to make sure that we're all in it together and we're all on pace because yep. we're human. Some people forget things. Um, but, but I'm one of the trainers for the office. And, and so when I am helping agents understand procedures and things like that, I love to refer out. Um, I refer Michelle out all day long because I know that she does have the team approach as well. And I really appreciate you helping us here, um, understanding a, a lot of the uh, attorney perspective and how we as agents can help you 
uh, and keep the deal together on what you're responsible for, just like you're going to help us with sharing, um, you know, honest communication. Yeah, absolutely. And, and while we do have things obviously that legally fall under the attorney's role, like you can't really give advice on how to con cancel a contract that falls on me. Um, you know, practically we kind of fall into specific roles, but I have no problem crossing over when it's, um, permissible to do so, to make sure, you know, that, that we're moving forward. Um, and I think that's, that's something that's really important to having a, uh, a successful transaction. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Michelle, I don't know if you wanted to say anything on your end about uh, oh, her question. Yeah, so to, answer, to answer you, Kim, we do not have the agent involved at all to collect condo documents. Um, if we ever have an issue getting information from the HOA, we may ask if the listing agent can talk to the seller. Maybe there's someone, someone else, another name at the management company that can help us expedite things. But other than that, we don't ask for any assistance. We collect everything on our own. Excellent. Thank you for the clarity. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on condo docs? Okay, great. Um, so another thing to keep in mind throughout the transaction, obviously there's no stress contingency, um, but we as realtors and me, or you as realtors and me as the attorney, our goal really is to minimize stress for our clients um, because from stress comes you know, cold feet and um, second guessing whether they want to buy or sell. Um, so whenever we come across a hiccup or um, a hurdle in the transaction, yes, we need to um, you know, notify our clients of what's going on, but I think it's more important as um, a team, you know, me and my realtor partners uh, to discuss what's going on, come up with a game plan, how we can address any issues. Um, and then once we have a solution in place, then we, you know, notify the client, this is what's happening. You know, me and the realtor have talked, this is going to be the game plan. Um, just want to keep you in the loop, make sure that you're comfortable with that game plan, uh, you know, and, and move forward from there. Bringing problems up without that solution just creates unnecessary stress. And, you know, we don't, it's already a stressful process um, for, for most people. We don't need to be adding to that. Totally agree. Never bring a nope. problem without a solution. Nope. Yeah. Nope. It's a very big pet peeve of mine when people do that. I'm like, well, okay, great. What, what are we going to do to resolve that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then so Michelle um, has been a great realtor partner for me. We've worked on a, a few transactions together. Um, I'm looking for, for partnerships with like-minded realtors. And she immediately thought of your office and um, set this up for me to get to know you guys and for you guys to get to know me. Um, so I would love to learn more about each of your businesses and see how I can help everyone meet their goals for 2021 and beyond. Um, you can email me, uh, my information's on the next screen. I'll share it here in a second. Um, you can email me to set up a time to meet either virtually, um, over coffee, over lunch. Um, and as a thank you for being here today and taking time out of your schedule, um, I would like to offer your clients half off my attorney fee for, for listings only. Um, unfortunately, with, with buyers, um, the, the fee that we get as buyer's attorneys doesn't really allow for, for this much of a discount. Um, I'm sure as you guys know, title fees on the seller side is really what uh, helps attorneys keep our fees so low uh, and not charge hourly rates. So I'm willing to, to take half off my attorney fee for your listing clients. Uh, you can tell your clients that you negotiated this great uh, discount for them. It'd be a nice way for you to, you know, again, look good in front of your clients and save them hundreds of dollars. So can I ask how much is your uh, fees? So my fee is normally $750. Okay. So that is half of 50%. Yep. Okay. So three. Oh my God. I have to do math here. Yeah. 325. 325. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, I have to think before I just blurt that number out. Um, so here's my contact information. We have my, uh, my email. You guys can go on my website if you want. Uh, I also do estate planning so I can help clients protect their, their homes. If something were to happen to them. Um, it's one of the biggest purchases they'll ever make in their life. So a lot of people want to make sure that that's protected. Um, if something were to happen to them in the future. Oops. 
don't know why that just came up. And what about the buyer's attorney fees? How much is yours fee? Um, that's seven fifty as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question for you. Shoot. So, right now, um, first of all, thank you for all that information. I learned a couple things today, but I, I didn't know. I didn't know about not being able to send the inspection report in the seven point oh. So. Um, Right now, I've been experiencing, uh, you know, there's a lot of pushback on buyers with FHA. So my, mm -hmm. my realtor partners are all asking me, can my FHA buyers go conventional? Because sellers want conventional financing. So my question is this. Um, if a buyer puts in an offer con with a conventional loan mm -hmm. and they, used to choose, they choose to use an FHA loan because the terms are better for them, mm -hmm. how, how is the contingency... In the, in the contract protecting them or hurting them? Because my thought process is that they can go, they can go conventional on the offer. If they mm -hmm. switch to FHA and then let's say that the property doesn't meet FHA requirements, they can't get an FHA denial because there wasn't an FHA loan contingency. It was a conventional mm -hmm. loan. So they mm -hmm. could only get a denial for a conventional loan. Mm -hmm. um, am I missing something more that you know I should be telling my buyers if they choose to, to flip the, prop, the loan type without changing it on the contract. Yeah, so my third, first thought there is whether flipping the loan type is going to result in any sort of delays. No delays, so we're still closed on time. Okay, then yeah, I don't I don't see any issue with it. Um, the con So the loan information on the contract protects the buyers because if they can't get that specific type of loan, then they don't have to, close on the property. They would just, we would provide notice to the seller that um, client was unable to obtain a loan under the loan terms of the contract. And, you know, we're canceling the contract or we're asking for more time to, to figure this out. Um, a, a kind of a side note on that um, with requesting or with putting in the interest rate, we want to put in something there. And this is kind of where it's important to, I put the to come in. Um, and make sure we consult the lender like Michelle on the contract. We want a, a reasonable interest rate on there, but we don't want anything so, um, we don't want so much wiggle room that the client is forced into taking such a high interest rate. Um, so that's something else that I've seen. I haven't seen it recently. Um, a couple of years ago, I actually had a transaction where the interest rate was about a full point and a half higher than um, what should have been on there. And I changed that during attorney review because I didn't want the client to be locked in um, with a ridiculously high interest rate and forced to, to close with that. So kind of just a side note there. Yeah. Awesome. So you guys heard it first. So if your buyers <laughs> qualify conventional and FHA, and I, and I, this is what I've told them, you go conventional FHA, use the conventional offer for the contract, I mean, if, if the FHA is going to make more sense, you're not, you're not, a, you're not necessarily obligated to the conventional option, but if something happens with that FHA appraisal, then, you know, then you may have to flip the, uh, the loan type. And, and then that could be a reason for the seller to, to want to cancel if you're not meeting the, um, the dates on the contract. So I just had this scenario you know, happened last month. It was a conventional offer. I don't even know how the seller accepted it. It was a conventional offer with 10% down. I had a FHA pre-approval letter with three and a half percent down. So they obviously didn't use my pre-approval letter or the seller didn't ask for it. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, you know, appraisal came back with repairs and the seller was like, well, we didn't accept an FHA offer. So we're not doing anything. And my buyer did the repairs and we closed. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to say with that, with that um, inspection, that could be the only the only hiccup I could see is uh, getting the seller to agree to make those repairs. And then also uh, whether they'd still be able to close. Is there like a waiver or something that they have to, do you guys accept waivers that the buyer will take on the repairs within a certain so time period? We don't even, um, like as a lender, we're not verifying who's doing the repairs. We're just verif verifying that the repairs are being completed. So the attorney, the seller's attorney did have, he drew up a legal document saying that the sellers were going to be 
you know, exempt from any liabilities mm -hmm. and they wanted to get licensing for anybody that was doing the work. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a major job. There was a, it was mostly paint job, mm -hmm. but you know, it's a, uh, again, I don't even know how, like, I, I guess I didn't even pay attention that it was conventional, like on the contract when we first got it in. So, you know, I'm like, oh, the FHA appraisal came back and we need all this stuff. And they're like, we're not doing anything. So, um, you know, we were able to close, but um, for those that do qualify FHA and conventional, you know, I've been telling my buyers, you know, stick with the conventional offer, even, you know, if you think that you might go FHA, because my thought process was that, and I just wanted to make sure that I was giving them good advice that you're yeah. protected as long as you, you're protected with the contingency with a conventional loan. So if it doesn't work out FHA, you have to go conventional. Otherwise yep. you can't cancel it and get your earnest money back. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a great strategy. We'll see. Uh, I haven't dealt with that a, a lot in practice, so we'll see, you know, um, practically how, how that shakes out. Yeah. Cool. Anyone else have any other questions? Um, I have a question about tax prorations. Yeah, go. Um, when you're reviewing the offer for tax prorations, um, is that something that you address and, and you focus on as well to assist to make sure that the proration is going to be um, in the best interest of the, the clients on either side? Yes. Um, so typically the um, property tax proration is already included in the offer and the contract sometimes it says tbd or to be determined during attorney review um, i look at the um the last so it's based on the last full year's tax bill which right now is for 2019. um i will request 100 110 percent for my buyers um, and then if I represent a seller, I'll request 105%. Generally, it's a couple hundred dollars difference between the two, um, the two percentages. So it doesn't, at the end of the day, um, if we're going back and forth with that amount, I break it down mathematically and let them, my clients know, you know, 105% would be this much of a credit, 110% would be this much of a credit. Um, what I'm seeing recently because of the, um, because of COVID, the assessor reassessed, um, all of the properties in, in Cook County, they are all, um, their assessed value has been lowered. So a lot of um, buyers, attorneys, myself included, are requesting lower, um, lower proration percentages because the tax bills are going to be um, a little bit lower. So I'm seeing a lot of 100 percent and 105 percent right now instead of kind of the standard 105 110. Got it. yeah and, and then that's what i'm seeing too and a lot of this is being handled by agents during the negotiation period and and that's why i want to make sure that our agents can reassure that the attorneys do review that in attorney uh, review period yeah. um because sometimes it's killing deals before we can even get them accepted that mm -hmm. one little you know and it sounds ridiculous and that's why a lot of people don't understand the, the difference between the 105 to 110. And is it really a deal breaker when we break it down and the attorney will re-review it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, and, and I just wanted to confirm that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I find when you break it, it's kind of this obscure random number when you're saying 105% and 110%. Um, but when you break it down mathematically, it's like, are you, is this deal worth, canceling over a couple hundred bucks and it's exactly not so yeah and do you see a lot of to be determines come across your desk i do yeah probably okay. about half thank you you're welcome any other questions All right. Well. Great. Well, I put my um, my email and my phone number in the chat for everybody. Um, I don't know if something happened with my screen share. I don't know if that was taken away from me or if my computer did something. Um, so I put my my information in the chat. Uh, if anybody wants to get together, uh, more than happy to to meet virtually or in person. You know, whatever you guys are comfortable with. Awesome. Well, thanks, Megan. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. It was a pleasure meeting you. I look forward to working with you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Megan, for all the answers. Pleasure.
thank you Kim. yeah thank, thank you. you so much thank you all right well if you guys have questions please feel free to reach out and hope everyone has a great day Good thank, thank you, you Michelle. So much. have a Bye. great day have a great Bye, day everyone. thanks Megan thank you thank bye. you Michelle. bye bye bye